So my name is Carwina. I am from Indiana, and I want to thank you again for hosting us all here today. This is the final session on entrepreneurial pedagogy, what is being done in the classroom to innovate. And my co-chair is going to introduce very briefly all of our speakers. We have that, and then we will launch into our discussion. We have asked the speakers to talk about how they teach, how and why they innovate, what they think works, what doesn't work, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Carlina. My name is Ekaterina Moskova, and I would like to uh, very shortly introduce our panelists uh, for today. Um, uh, Professor Georgi Patilin from uh, the uh, <coughs> Russian uh, Foreign Trade Academy at Russia. Um, also, uh, Professor Ashis uh, from uh, Chindal School, and uh, um, as well as uh, Professor Alexander Nineva. Also, to the uh, Global Law School and uh, uh, Professor Karam, Jindal uh, uh, Global Law School as well. Uh, we have brilliant panelists today. Oh, oh, sure. And uh, Professor Suchi, Suchi uh, um, yeah, uh, great. Um, we are happy you joined. Uh, and uh, we were missing you yesterday. Uh, well, I think that now I can give the floor to our first panelist. Um, um, Georgi Patulin is uh, our young colleague uh, who is um, who demonstrated brilliant um, teaching, uh, innovative teaching techniques, and uh, introduced us to students teaching his pretty theoretical subjects. And we thought it would be ideal if he uh, speaks at this panel and share uh, some of uh, his experience. And uh, Georgi, the floor is Thank you. And uh, may I please ask to start the presentation? And, uh, former uh, students, high school students come and uh, they have uh, to get new information about what's the state, what's the law is, and how they work, and how can we appeal those rules in our everyday life. Uh, they usually lose their sense of uh, at first time. Uh, I uh, see my place in this educational process and my aim is to show them that uh, there is nothing more practical thing rather than a good theory and uh, to make them see connections uh, between uh, theoretical knowledge and our everyday practice. Uh, so the first hour a class usually starts uh, about what is a state and what is a law. <coughs> and uh, I'd like to ask dear colleagues and students uh, who are participating <coughs> this day uh, here to make uh, a small painting. Please, just draw a state and a law so that the person who doesn't speak your native language and uh, communicates only with the help of pictures, could say, now I see the law and the state. Just you have one minute, minute with a half. Just whatever you want. It shouldn't be very academical. <laughs> Please, who wants, can, can uh, start right now. Okay. <laughs> So does anyone want uh, to show what he has right now? What picture? No? I'm still working on it. Uh-huh. Ten seconds more. <laughs> So, any pictures? Just yes, whatever it be. Uh, so, what's AHA? The state, yeah, India. And the law? Law is all around. All around. Okay. So, what students usually paint? G. Uh, it also has a state. No, I have a state, an abstract state, but then uh, it has a river that's protected by a border. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Just, uh, they are not famous painters, so, so this is just the concept of what I usually get from them. 
And then my question usually is, I can see a spot or a man in a crowd or a book or a lady. Where is the state? Where is the law? Why do you think that this is the law? The text, constitution, that's just the book with the text, with some symbols. The law is the, the rule, which we use in our everyday life. The text is something like this. The state is not just a territory. And that means that the concept of the state and the law, they, first of all, are in our minds. And that's why uh, there are no right or wrong answers at our classes. And my students just uh, begin to speak much more freely. They are not afraid uh, to give a wrong answer and uh, to get a bad mark, but so they understand <coughs> that it's hard to be wrong or to be absolutely right when we are speaking about state and law. Uh, the other thing is, uh, for example, uh, in my course, is uh, what's rule of law and what is the rule and what is the structure of the rule and what's statutory interpretation. But firstly, I should just let know what uh, it is. And usually, it, again, it is uh, being made by lecturing, but not in this case. Uh, so. If we speak about statutory interpretation, uh, first of all, I'd like my students uh, to give an answer of those three questions. And please, dear students, how do you think, newcomers? Are the rules obvious? Obvious, yes. Is it easy to understand what uh, do the government wants from us under the rule. Would anyone like to answer one of the students? There's a student back there who answers. Do you think it's obvious what the state wants us to do in terms of its laws? I'm going to have to call on someone. Shy. So, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, we have a rule, last in, first on. <laughs> last person. Who was the last person to enter the room? He's still standing. He's still standing, He's sir. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Indian laws are, are, are obvious? What the Indian rules are? Are they obvious to you? Are they easy to understand or read? Um, the structuring or the phrasing of the laws is inherently very complex. So even uh, some very basic laws such as the Consumer Protection Act, which is in passed in 2019, which defines what a consumer is, is so complicated that even the basic consumer, which is us, doesn't know what it is. The answer is no. But that was an answer about statutes. And we are speaking about only one rule, just one. For example, no vehicles in the park, the famous exercise. Uh, that shows that different methods of interpretation are used to get the results uh, that are wanted by different persons. For example, uh, this is the situation. The park has become overrun by vehicles and was no longer enjoyable for citizens of the community. And then the legisl legislature responded to the complaints and passed the law. So the law is no vehicles in the park. Law enforcement officers take a strict approach to enforcing the law so every test path get, gets arrested. Please, right now, just individually, answer next questions. Is it allowed or prohibited under the provision of the law to drive through the park to ambulance? Just yes or no? And uh, please make a mark in your notebook or whatever. Is it allowed uh, or prohibited to drive through the park to a person using a wheelchair? Yes. 
hand, is it allowed or prohibited to ride bicycles in the park? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, question is, is it allowed or prohibited under the provision of the law to use drones in the park, toy helicopters? Or to place a war monument, for example, tank in the park. Where is the rule? Yeah? Easy to understand. No vehicles in the park. So, what are your answers? Who'd like to start for ambulance? Yeah. So I just Googled the definition of vehicle to make sure that it's <laughs> <laughs> an example. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if vehicle would be defined by uh, the rules of the park, same as uh, as it was in goal, Yeah. So uh, I start my classes with the definitions. And mm -hmm. I'm very strict about that. So vehicle is a thing for transporting people or goods, especially on land, especially but not exclusively, such as car, lorry, or cart. So according to this definition, ambulance is definitely not allowed. Uh, a person uh, uh, allowed wheelchair, not allowed. Uh, bicycle is not allowed. Uh, drone is allowed because it's not transporting people. And mm -hmm. war monument probably also is not allowed if it's a real vehicle, uh -huh. not the representation of the vehicle. Thank if it's a vehicle a, capable of transportation, yeah. then it's not allowed. Okay. And uh, who'd allow <coughs> ambulance to go through the park? Mm -hmm. or if there is another law with a non substantive which says... No, we have only this law, only this rule. Under this rule, if there is no exception, you have to check if there is an exception. Aha. Uh -huh. But then... Uh, sorry. But then we can speak about the aim of the rule, uh, just what it was uh, <coughs> made for. Uh, we can uh, speak about uh, how should we apply the rule uh, and what should we keep in mind. Uh, what's more important for us, uh, a person's life who is in the vehicle, in the ambulance vehicle, or just uh, the rule itself? Uh, what is a vehicle by itself? Yeah, yeah. So, so what's about drones and so on and so forth? And uh, this is only uh, the first of such, of the uh, study of such exercises which uh, we do with our students. Because uh, this, exactly this part, I use when I'm lecturing. And then when we have uh, practical uh, classes, seminars, uh, we are talking about Russian laws, and provision of Russian laws, about tax laws. And uh, then uh, they just uh, say, oh, it's impossible, uh, how can we live in such a country if uh, we have to pay taxes, but we don't have to pay taxes uh, by the, under the provision of the tax code. Uh, uh, that means uh, that uh, even if we speak about theoretical disciplines... Uh, you had an intervention. No, I was just uh -huh. wondering if you uh, raised the question of... Yeah. Uh, in, in getting them to think about a law and interpreting its meaning, do they look at it? It was very good for you to start by looking at the definition of vehicle, but you have the intent of the drafters, mm -hmm. you have the textual interpretation, yeah. and you have the theological interpretation. Sure. The three types of reasoning as to what does the law actually yeah. say. Uh, and and that, does that come out in the class? Uh, yeah, 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 sure. And uh, for us, it's uh, still important. Uh, what's your position uh, about what is the law itself? How do you understand it? Because uh, keeping in mind that, uh, you can have uh, different answers on the same question. If we're speaking about uh, natural law and uh, human <coughs> rights, uh, then sure, ambulance uh, would uh, pass through the park. If, uh, we're take, uh, if we're speaking about law as a will of uh, the state, then surely not, because it's text and uh, there are no exclusions. Except exceptions. Uh, so I believe that interactive methods uh, help our students uh, just to understand uh, why studying law is important, 
why it is uh, impossible just uh, to become a lawyer, almost impossible to become a lawyer by yourself just uh, reading uh, texts of laws, statutes. And, uh, and uh, that was my last word. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, I would be glad uh, to Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Lectures, but a lot of discussions with students. I'm an economist by training. Uh, I teach economics courses. Unfortunately, in law schools in India, economics has to be taught as a course subject not once but twice. Uh, Bar Council of India wants that, but it's important. Uh, but I also teach an elective on economic analysis of law, which is uh, quite interesting for some of the law students. What I want to talk about is uh, uh, based on what I teach and what I've studied, uh, some contradictions and dilemmas in the, within the discipline of economics. And based on those sort of weaknesses, there have been some innovations. That's a loose way of interpreting, uh, inter interpreting the word innovation, but two innovations that have emerged in the last few years based on those dilemmas. Um, so I'm going to be a bit more critical about my own discipline. Um, but having said that, it's a, it's, it's a discipline I deeply admire. It's in the elite group of uh, six disciplines that get the Nobel Prize uh, every year, along with chemistry, physics, literature. Um, and, but I, I, I truly believe that it helps us imagine and analyze alternate futures. Um, and maybe that's where entrepreneurial mindset comes in as well. And the objective always uh, of someone teaching economics, uh, at least, is to help the student deconstruct reality. And it's fast changing uh, everywhere. Um, what we also know with a lot of certainty is that this discipline failed miserably in the last few years, particularly. Um, and it failed miserably at its job number one, which was let's ensure that we don't repeat uh, a financial crisis of the magnitude and extent that we saw in the United States, which engulfed the entire world several decades ago. And it happened. Uh, in fact, the first, ones to, uh, the first one to ask this question was the Queen. Uh, she asked a lot of British economists that you guys didn't see this coming for so many years. Uh, so it's, a, it's a very interesting question uh, to ask. Why, why didn't economists see this coming? Um, we also know that ideas of economists, um, political philosophers, both good and bad, can have massive ramifications and consequences on, um, on, how, on how societies shape up and evolve. Um, and there's, here's something that may frighten you or make you happy, depending on how comfortable you are with economics or how well you scored in your courses, that people who are responsible for policy making, economic policy making, and how the economy works, or the money that floats around in any country, in any economy, all of that is done by people who have studied economics, who teach economics, who continue to teach e uh, economics while they do the policy uh, uh, preparation. And in the US, they are most certainly economics professors. Um, so where does that bring, uh, bring us? It's, we know that a lot of politic, domestic political struggles, social struggles, be it Russia, America, India, uh, in, in African countries, they will have something to do with a lack of an economic opportunity somewhere or economic inclusion somewhere. There's a lot of build up, but I'm coming to the innovation part. Uh, we also know that India is currently undergoing an economic slowdown. We know that Brexit for sure is this one silly economic arithmetic which no one is able to figure out. We know that the last presidential elections in the US, uh, probably one of the most divisive, but everyone I think agreed on one fact that there is an economic turmoil which we have to fix. They all had different prescriptions though. Um, so the dilemmas are two in nature. One is inherent to the discipline, which is the sheer emphasis on what we call as neoclassical economics, not really paying attention to how to understand real decision making, real human behavior, and that's where behavioral economics uh, comes in. Uh, two economists won the Nobel Prize recently for their work in understanding human behavior. 
uh, but a not not a lot is being done to mitigate this weakness of having a unified theory to understand the human behavior at the micro level or behavior of economic systems at the macro level. That's one dilemma. The other one is inability to understand external development. So if there is a financial crisis, then making sure that it does not really impact an economic system, fragile or robust, anytime in the near future. So that's two, two problems. Now, these two dilemmas uh, helped us, at least the economists and, and the scholars in, in the field of economics, come up with two innovations. I'll briefly touch on them in two minutes, and I, I, and I hope that I can cover them in the discussion. The first one was uh, something called as the core project. It started uh, about seven years ago. It stands for Curriculum Open Access Resources in Economics. Uh, a lot of universities are following it. It essentially says that we are not going to follow the same conventional traditional models and theories. Um, two universities where I have studied, Erasmus University, Rotterdam University of Manchester, they both follow it. Azim Premji University in India follows it. We don't, but we are trying to switch a little bit. King's College, Cornell. So there's, a, there's an awakening that there's something seriously wrong with the discipline and we need to fix it. The other uh, um, the impetus behind this kind of in innovation was what happened. Two interesting things happened in 2011. One was the Wall Street protest, if you remember, uh, Occupy Wall Street. And uh, the motivation was to figure out what's causing or driving inequality, greed, corruption, and, and, and uh, this rusting of the financial system, so to speak. And the second thing, interesting thing that happened was at Harvard University. So Gregory Mankiw, a very senior economics professor, he's advised uh, George Bush, even Mitt Romney, I believe. Uh, he, he teaches this class, uh, Economics 1.0, which is very popular. Ek and 10. Yeah, OK, Ek 10. Um, and and uh, there, was a, there was a walkout. There was a student, uh, a group of students that actually culminated into 750 students voicing their concerns with how economics is being taught. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> And by the way, ManQ is taught even at our law school. I have used this textbook to teach our law students uh, in, in Jindal, uh, and it's very popular. Um, there was a lot of backlash. Um, ManQ replied with a long piece in New York Times trying to say that, uh, that the, the principles of free market still works. You may have some problems, but it's really foundational economics. He covered it up really well. Um, but I, I really, I, I strongly believe that it's time to think, uh, at least in economics, at the foundational level, what is, what is being taught? Is it really helping us understand what's going on around us? And are we able to answer the real questions? I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was just ideally uh, planned in, in terms of the uh, time. And uh, uh, the next uh, panelist today is uh, Professor Sandra Mileva. And you... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, no, no. Because, no, uh, because I'm in a hurry, I was prepared to start talking. <laughs> Yes, I, you have to introduce me. <laughs> yes, so I will let me introduce again. <laughs> um, so Professor Alexandra Mineva, who is an assistant professor in Jindal School uh, of International Affairs. And uh, we will be uh, happy to hear what you prepared. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer. And I was asked uh, to speak in this panel because um, uh, since I started at uh, JGU four years ago, I um, have developed and taught eight courses. In four years, it's a huge amount of courses, and my courses are not based on my major. I was teaching basically uh, everything, starting from sociology to undergraduate, to diplomatic negotiations, diplomatic protocol, ancient Chinese philosophy, postmodern theory, uh, and so on. So there is uh, no common ground between the courses. And um, uh, as time goes by, I have realized that important is not what you teach, but how you teach. 
Uh, over the run of these four years, I have realized that I became rather an educator than an expert uh, in a field. Uh, my field is Sinology, I'm Sinologist, uh, and I'm capable of teaching anything to any group of people. Uh, in terms of pedagogy and andragogy. But it uh, requested a lot of effort, uh, especially in terms of pedagogy. So in my presentation, I would like to uh, outline certain problems that I faced here as a young, unexperienced um, educationalist, uh, the way I've solved them and the results. Uh, and I, if the time will be enough, I'd also share some of my methods, but I can also do it later. I prepared, but I think it will take time to plug and uh, replug, and printouts are really not enough. I didn't expect such a crowd. So I started here four years ago as an unexperienced educator, just after completing my <coughs> education in four countries, Russia, France, United Kingdom, and China. All of the system of education are completely different. Uh, one from another, and very different from uh, what I could ever expect to face in India. First of all, my uh, overall image is completely different from what an Indian student would expect a female uh, teacher or professor to be. So I didn't work on that, I decided to go with the flow. My first course, uh, in my first year, I was not expected that I will be asked to teach at all, as I have joined as a researcher. Uh, I was asked to teach and my dean told me, you graduated from an excellent school, just teach exactly as an LSC. And I had it on the back of my mind that British system of education didn't work for me, I hated it. How can it work for these people? Okay, maybe they get used to something like that. It was a complete failure. <coughs> It was a complete failure. For those of you who maybe don't know, British, uh, at least LSE system of education, is one hour lecture where a professor talks wherever, uh, gives you a romantic or uh, warrior image of the topic, and handles you a list of uh, 150 readings for the next week, and you don't know what to do with that. That's it. Uh, it, it was a great challenge and educational experience in, in terms of managing myself and my mental health. In terms of knowledge, I don't know. So I tried it here, it didn't work either. Uh, uh, so um, the next challenge was, the apart from the clashes of system of education, uh, I have realized that teaching in a private university in the country with booming education is a very different experience from anything I used to experience before. Russia is a very homogeneous country, China is an homogeneous country, uh, France is a diverse country with a strong imposition of French cultural values. <coughs> so even as a foreigner, you uh, subscribe, you surrender to those values. And the UK is in a similar way. It kind of uh, asks you to surrender. Not India. Uh, there was uh, one or two international students in my class, in my classes, in four years. However, I have never faced such a diverse crowd as a class where every single student is Indian. There is no such a diversity possible in terms of everything. Culture, language, background, uh, education received before, the form of education, the habits of education. I had to face this as well. Um, and um, uh, another problem was the gap in all senses. I felt myself very young and I still didn't step out of the student's shoes. However, I was in a position of an educator and I have realized that in my classroom, when I was a student some years ago back in Russia, using the PPT for the presentation was uh, discussed as an innovation. Then I realized how huge is the gap between me and my students in terms of teaching methods and uh, expectations from the classroom. That uh, uh, technical innovation is not something that I decided to focus on, neither in my work nor in my presentation today. Uh, so my goals, uh, my <coughs> overall goals in teaching was to create methods that will allow me 
to bring my curriculum to as many students in my classroom as possible. Because uh, as you can imagine, fail, failing a student in a private uh, university is also not a solution. By failing, you're adding stress to a student, you're adding yourself work, but you do not reach something that is my main goal. You don't reach better <coughs> education because student doesn't have to repeat the course. He will come back next year as stressed as he is, uh, sit the same exam and probably fail it again. Therefore, I had to create a curriculum which would allow students with the less of experience to learn the basics and not to fail, and students who are in the top of the class uh, not to get bored. Uh, it is very difficult. Uh, I was given an advice to go for average. However, in India, in a classroom of 80 people, People who are not at the top, at, not at the bottom, are not at the top or in the bottom for very different reasons. There is no average. There is nothing you can call average. Everyone is so unique and everyone's reasons for not making it to an O are, are very, very different. So uh, my second goal was to... Um, <clears throat> uh, my, my third, sorry, that was the second. My third goal uh, was to make sure that those who are capable of more are getting the opportunity to go extra mile and are getting the opportunity not to get bored. I only have one minute left, so I will um, go to my methods uh, directly. Uh, I had to shorten down my presentations and I had to make sure that all the basic readings are in my class presentations. We have very long classes here, I have the opportunity. So I, I uh, made sure that even if you didn't read the reading for the class, and attended my lecture, you can pass the exam concerning this particular lecture. However, I also made sure that if you only done that, you are never gonna get a B plus or A. So if you want a B plus or A, you have to work extra. And uh, uh, in my class, uh, I made it very clear what exactly you have to do by splitting the readings, by splitting the questions. How do I reach it in my exams? How do you do it in examination? How do you differ differentiate the level of students in your examination? I brought, I made a printout which I can um, pass uh, around, not to waste time. Uh, that's an um, example of... Um, one of the exams in sociology. And uh, please pay attention on the last question, question number seven, and uh, take it for, believe me that uh, if you don't, um, is the part of the exam, but if you don't answer question number seven, you are not getting an O. There is, you can choose what question to answer and each question is given a price. And if you don't answer question number seven, if you choose any other question, you won't be given an O. The question before question number seven are based on the theory and on the knowledge I hope everyone will bring out of my classroom. Question number seven is based on the theory, is based on the uh, additional readings, but most of all is based on your ability to analyze and be creative. You cannot, you, if you do not have three of those, you will not even understand the question. Uh, I would be really happy to share more methods after the presentation, but uh, this is my uh, conclusion that um, uh, in my work I have to balance between pedagogy and, and andragogy because my, my students are not grown-ups yet, but not children, and I strive to achieve maximum results for maximum number of students. I want that after completing my course, the largest amount of students are capable to talk about the nature of the course I was teaching and are capable to analyze if their analytical abilities already developed. On the way, I'm helping those who have not to reach up to the standard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Just a very quick question. Um, this is the moment. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have very long classes here. Could you please uh, comment on this? How long? Just so understand. my course, uh, my course, uh, average course is 15 lectures mm -hmm. of three hours. Okay. 
So at uh, every uh, so in our understanding it would be thirty lectures. So in uh, uh, yeah in uh, on Monday I will have class on Chinese philosophy which will come uh, start at six o'clock and finish at nine o'clock. Okay, you just have double lectures as we would say. So yeah. thank you very much. And uh, yes, and um, it's a pleasure for me to give the floor to uh, the uh, assistant professor and assistant dean of the Jindal uh, Global Law School, uh, Professor Karam, please. Speaking, I was I was. Uh, I was under the impression that you know I've turned up for exam underprepared, and now you know so like if everyone is like you know uh, uh, sharing their personal feedback as to the classes they conduct and how they go around uh, around like you know uh, <clears throat> answering doubts and like you know facing challenges, so I will also like you know uh, kind of uh, place before you the challenges that I personally faced uh, with respect to uh, the subject that I teach. So I'm very, uh, very new to academia, and my experience, when compared to everyone on the panel, is is quite uh, like less. I'm, I won't say I'm as experienced, but uh, the subject that I teach, which happens to be a core subject for the for the law students, is something that has taken me a long way, at least with respect to experience of like what are the students' requirements and how you go about addressing them. Uh, like if uh, so, my my subject at law school is is uh, company law or a corporate law, as you may know. And the biggest challenge that I face with respect to this subject uh, is that in India, company law is quite boring. And it is it is it is true because it's a it's a very thick law. It's it's a massive law because the Indian Parliament believes in having a descriptive. Uh, law rather than a prescriptive law, which is left to everybody's imagination. So everything, how it needs to be done is mentioned in the law. The procedure is long, the substantive law is long, the classes are long, and hence the semester seems long. Though it's not, but it seems very long. And uh, the first class I entered, and I was faced with this hostility from certain students uh, who believe that company law is a capitalist law, and it has nothing to do with socialism. So I was taken aback when I was prepared with a lecture on what is a private company and a public company and one student raises his hand and asks me, India being a socialist country, why does it have company law? And that, is, that, that was my start uh, with the subject and, and I spent many sleepless nights on the question because actually it was very true. Our corporate form is a capitalist device. And how do you, like, you know, integrate that device into a socialist country is something that is like, you know, of of umpteen importance because till the time you don't satisfy that doubt, that student is never going to be interested in the subject. And that is when I started like you know evolving. So for me, innovation in classroom was not a discretion, it was a mandate. And I felt that you know this is the biggest challenge that I have to face and overcome, wherein I have to demonstrate before the class that even though we are doing a law that like you know everything is there in the book. Uh, like how it is done and what it is done. So like as, as we were discussing so far that law is all about what it is and how it should be done. For me the challenge, want, uh, challenge was why is this law there in the first place? And the jurisprudential aspect of the law is what got me going and integrating it with practical experiences is something that worked for me. So uh, having practiced uh, like in a corporate law firm for, for at least three years and having the experience of the Supreme Court, I kind of brought that into my classroom, wherein every legal section, every legal provision was supplemented by a real life example. And that is what I do before my every class. So I just go through the sections that I have to teach. And I read the section in the class, but what is most important is how this section is put to work in real life, right? Where the students actually get a sense of how this law is going to play out. And that is where now the ball gets transferred to the students with this kind of unlimited experience of how the law, or how to apply the law in the real life, and then they need to decide whether they want to really go ahead with it or not. So this is the transformation that I try to achieve every semester, and I want my students to make an informed decision after they have been taught company law, rather than just being biased towards a subject because it's boring or it's, it's too much to deal with. So that is, that is one point. The second point which I feel and that has changed uh, in classroom especially like so it was hardly 10 12 years ago when I was doing my company law for the first time and uh, how the classroom used to be structured at that point in time was that the professor was the leader 
and the students used to follow the professor with respect to the topics and the lectures. However, with the advent of social constructivism, I believe that now the student is the center of the classroom. And that is why whatever a professor does in a classroom has to cater to the need of the student. It is not uh, the convenience of the professor, but it is the convenience of the student that, that needs to be addressed, that needs to be catered to. And that is where I feel that uh, it is the teacher who needs to innovate again. It's, it's, it's not a discussion for me, as I told you, it's, it's a mandate. And I also need to understand what a particular classroom like, you know, is, is demanding of me. And uh, Jindal has uh, two uh, broad uh, law courses. One is the BA LLB program. And the second is the BB LLB, which is like a, a business, a Bachelor of Business Administration and Law. And it is before I enter that class, I cannot decide what kind of pedagogy I'm going to, uh, I'm going to follow. So my pedagogy follows my students. It's not the subject, it's not the country, it's not the institution, but it is the handful of people who I'm going to address in that particular class that drives me to innovate and that drives me to like think about what I'm going to say in the class. Uh, another thing which I feel uh, I am a little responsible uh, for because I teach a subject which is like you know so integral to uh, a lot of people who want to who wish to take up a law firm jobs uh, later on or a corporate job later on is to make my students understand the job market. So it is not just the subject that I need to like you know uh, like uh, tackle in the, in the in the in the class. I also need to tackle the questions with respect to what to do after we get uh, after we graduate from law school, and uh, that is where it is my. Uh, I'll, I'll try to just wrap up at this point. So it is it is it is my fundamental duty to make them understand that you know the job market that they are entering is such a dynamic market where apart from like you know uh, their education, they themselves need to innovate. And uh, that innovation can come through a group discussion that can come through like, you know, uh, doing some practical exercises together, the team building exercises, because teamwork in, in a corporate form is, is extremely important. And lastly, uh, the, the, the end of the semester for me is always uh, telling my students that this is not the end. And everyone needs to have an exit strategy because corporate law has been there for a long time. But everyone needs to like move on with the new, uh, like, you know, commercial laws that are coming up. And I always tell them that you know it is it is you who should decide when to quit corporate law and start doing something else which like further appeals to you. So I guess I guess that's that's like my limited experience uh, at Jindal Global Law School, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Karam, and um, we have uh, a lot of the list panelists and. Um, uh, I'm uh, happy to give the floor to Professor uh, Shuchi Sinha. Um, please, go ahead. Uh, in fact, I'm going to refer to some of them when I talk about uh, the pedagogy that I have tried to follow as well. So first up, I, I would agree with Professor Ashish uh, who said that the basic pedagogy really cannot change that much uh, I particularly feel for my discipline as well, which is law. And primarily given my background, which is uh, a practitioner of corporate law, I was uh, in law firms for well over a decade and, and then I moved into academia. Uh, the requirement for any student who is going to pursue this discipline does include a lot of uh, past knowledge, if you will. Uh, they, they need to absorb legal theories, they need to absorb uh, legal strategies, and only then would they ever be in a position to practice law or to innovate. Uh, so the basic, uh, the basic strategy of my teaching follows precisely the same pattern as, as Professor Ashish was mentioning as well. And one of the things that I like to do to think about innovations that are required in the class is to look back at my experience as a law student. Uh, and if I were to look back at the best professors, the ones who really made an impression, uh, the, the, the formula was quite simple. They were professors who knew their subject inside out. They were very confident. And because they knew the subject inside out, could articulate it in a very simple and concise manner. That is the basics of pedagogy. If you don't have that, then whatever whiz-bang you bring to the classroom, 
uh, your students are really not going to benefit so much. So my first point uh, of conduct is to make sure that I have thought and rethought what I'm about to teach so that I can present it in the simplest flow of concise principles and that actually is harder than it looks. The easiest thing for a professor is to have a thick bundle of notes and read out to the class or, or just sort of give a discourse. Uh, but to simplify without losing the meaning of it is probably the most difficult and that takes the maximum work from every professor. Okay, so going forward however and, and as Karan, uh, Professor Karan very rightly mentioned that the classroom has changed. Uh, we are no longer where I was 25 years ago, sitting in a law school. Uh, the, the students uh, have changed and frankly, even more importantly, the real world has changed. The tolerance for students who step out into the market without being able to hit the ground running is much lower than it was in our time. And as someone who has practiced, uh, practiced for such a long time, uh, and, and who recruited for my law firm uh, as, as a partner in my law firm, uh, I'm very aware of what could be the gaps in what students have picked up in, in, in a law school classroom and what they're expected to do uh, actually at their jobs. So the techniques that I use are, are aimed towards two things. One, bridge the gap between a law student and a law practitioner. Okay. The second, very important, um, and, and I think this is what law students perhaps would uh, appreciate a lot is to uh, cut through what is inevitable uh, as Professor Ekaterina was saying in a very long sorry, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a very uh, long uh, class that, that is about two and a half to three hours how do you keep people from not losing the flow of the topic because it is a lot to take in at one go so my whatever innovations I have attempted are just aimed at these two things. So what I'm going to do is I have a very, very brief PPT. Uh, every slide has literally one word. And, and I know my students, if any of them were there, would be like, why doesn't this happen in our class? I actually <laughs> follow exactly what you said, Professor, and put maximum uh, content onto the slide so students who aren't reading outside of class still pass my class. But today I can afford to have brief Nice slide. So, so let me put up my first PPT and, and discuss some of those innovations. Is discuss each uh, uh, each innovation, and uh, right at the end, I'm going to take two minutes of your time to show you some of those in action. I have two tiny videos to show you. Let's let's pray to the tech gods that they work today. But they're, they're each of them are about 50 seconds, so it's not long. But just to show you uh, how sometimes uh, the the innovation or doing something different can can really make the class come alive uh, and sort of wake, uh, and pay attention again to to what you're trying to teach. Okay, so the first. Uh, okay, so the thumb rule that I try to bring to the class is. You're not here to consume the material that the professor has prepared. You are here to experience and participate, and that is the only way to learn. If you're here to consume, it's too mechanical for you to remember. Okay? So, uh, based on that, the first one, flip classroom. Very simple. It's, it sounds fancier than it is. It simply means that the students take over the class and explain a particular subject. So, so as you mentioned, Professor, sometimes there are some students who are ahead of the class and they get bored. One of the ways to keep them interested is to give them an opportunity. Would you like to introduce the class to the next topic? And very often they're very happy to do that. And they're able to sort of uh, show to the class how well they've understood it. Uh, the other, now flipped classroom doesn't work that well at an undergrad level, which is where I treat, teach. I believe it's more suited for postgrad. But the, the one way I do use this method is a compulsory presentation component to the assessment where the students are given a topic to do as a team and present to the class. And a very important component of that presentation is what are your thoughts? And you can give us your craziest thoughts. So one of the courses I teach is banking and finance law. And if your topic is 
the high burden of stressed assets or the defaults which Indian banks are facing. What is your thought on it? And if you want to tell me the banks should be shut down and we should do something else, that's good too, as long as you're thinking. So that's flipped classroom. Okay. The next one, embrace e-sources. Uh, there was a time when professors hated it when students were on their devices in class. I've learned to embrace it. Uh, so what I do actually is channel them into using their devices in a constructive way. So if we are, for instance, let's say uh, if as part of my banking law, I'm teaching sources of credit and we are going to informal sources of credit, we're talking about money lenders. I would tell my class, do a Google search with the search word money lenders. Click on the tab news. Four of you read to me the first headline that comes out. It sort of wakes the class and, and it gets them out of, you know, the professors hate us for having devices. Okay, so embracing the e-source. Third, exit the matrix. I'm showing my age here. I think I'm the only one who gets excited with this terminology. Most of my students were toddlers when the Matrix movies came out. Uh, but uh, exit the matrix. What does it mean? Take the red pill. The matrix stands for the world of the mind, of theoretical concepts. And what I aim to do is to get the students out of theoretical mindscapes into the real world applications. So this could be a case study. Uh, this could be simply trying to apply each concept that we do in class in a hypothetical transaction, right? So exit the matrix. In every class, we have one particular uh, portion of the class which is just about exiting the matrix. Game it. Okay, I'll wrap up. Game it. Gamification. Uh, so it, just what it says on the label, bring in uh, as many games, puzzles, activities as you can to the class, time permitting. Uh, you know, we do have to get through a, a major theoretical portion as well. Uh, but what I try to do is to break the monotony of learning through the, through the base mode uh, by bringing in games. And the games are very simple in format, but they apply the most theoretical to, uh, principles that we, we learn in a fun manner. So it could be something you've done in kindergarten, literally matching different items on a sheet of paper. It could be a crossword where the clues are all about company law or banking law. Uh, it could be, I have a game called Banker's Bingo or Corporate Bingo, where you get a bingo sheet and you have, you're given tiles that you have to stick on to complete a bingo. And yeah, the reward may just be a bar of chocolate, but it just breaks the monotony of the class. Uh, so to give you some examples, let me show you a couple. Uh, here is somebody doing a crossword puzzle uh, in the class. This was a banker's crossword. It was the clues were all to do with uh, concepts. And the one side note which is pedagogical here is that when you frame the clues, put as much information as you can into the clue. It forces students to read that information and connect it to the word that they're finding. So the clues are not flat, they're quite long. Each clue to this crossword would have been a paragraph and it forces people to think. Uh, so that's a completed crossword that somebody had done and they, they got it all right, okay? Now this is a, it, it's a match item. So it's literally something you might have done in kindergarten, right? Uh, but it's just something fun for, for uh, students to do. This is a banking bingo. So one has to be very organized about it. I, I literally walk into class with a, a, a sack full of uh, tubes of glue and bingo tiles and bingo sheets and everyone's excited at the sight of professor like Santa Claus coming with this big sack <laughs> which is full of all sorts of funny items. They don't know what's going to happen in the class. Uh, and then they have to do this and I'll explain what this is. So they're given a blank sheet with this bingo uh, columns. Only the first column is there and there are tiles that they have to use the glue to stick on and match. So you have to finish all the lines correctly to get a bingo, right? And the first team to get a bingo, well, they just get a, a chocolate, but that's enough too. Uh, so so that's the, uh, that is a way to just get them to focus back on the class uh, without giving in to the monotony of a two and a half hour class uh, where very heavy theoretical and practical principles I'm done with this. So the last one that I want to talk about is the system reboot uh, system, okay? Uh, what is this? Now, a lot of students uh, by the second half of my class start to droop, okay? They, li they literally have had enough. 
uh, their systems are kind of powering down. They're, they're out of battery, literally, like a, like a laptop. So you need to do a system reboot. Do something else, wake them up, get them back into the class. And uh, this just means doing something very random and arbitrary, which doesn't seem like it has any connection to what you're teaching in the class. It could be, let's take the next 15 minutes, everybody walk out. Uh, we just studied what is, uh, you know, the, the binary system of shadow banking. So go out and pick a leaf which to you looks closest to the, to the, uh, to the structure that you just described to me and come back in 15 minutes. I mean, it could be something as random. It forces them still to think about banking law, but connect it with something that is quite fun and, and get some fresh air. So that's your system reboot. I'm done, uh, don't worry. I just have a minute or so. Uh, I want to show you the last two things that I wanted to talk, that I talked about, which is gamification and system reboot uh, in action. Uh, because as I mentioned, by the second hour of my class, very often students are looking droopy. Um, but, but when you offer them uh, a game, a bingo game, or and the system reboot I have to explain before I show you the video, I also teach mergers and acquisitions. So the way I get them to exit the matrix is to actually do a merger and acquisition negotiation in class. That also can be very heavy, it takes half the day. So at the end of a very heavy duty mergers and acquisition negotiation, there's a very random activity. So we had an exchange student who mentioned before his negotiation that he had learned some very groovy Indian dance moves. So once the negotiation was done, we said this team has to show us the dance moves that has been learned by Excuse him. Me. Yeah. Can we're we just done. show one because we want to make sure that we have some room for students before Yes, so. I'm done. Just, that was literally one. the last. Done. Thank you. Uh, so let me just... And is the sound... So this is uh, students sticking on tiles into a... They're sticking on bingo tiles. Second video, it's literally. Uh, first one in today. I, I have chocolate in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a little question. Yes. Yeah. Ask my question is to Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much for interesting information, for interesting methods. I think your students like your classes very much. But you told it is more important. How do you teach? Then what do you teach? Was it a mistake or you really think so? Uh, well, in terms of pedagogy, uh, in terms of, how can I say, no matter how boring your subject may seem, if you teach it, teach it's teach a little it different. Right? It's a difference. Okay. You, you can teach it. It's, it's, I don't say that knowledge is not important. Yeah. And for a <laughs> teacher, right. the Thank methods right. are very Thank important. Sushi. Sushi. Yes, sushi. 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 Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, let me officially invite you to be a visitor professor in Moscow State University of Manasa because SMS, SMS are hard your speech, your presentation, and I just show my colleague in the United States the, the same picture from my classes, then I teach commercial work. That's why this is official invitation for the next uh, education year for uh, one week visit Moscow. We, we, we will discuss later. And my question is for, for Alexandra. Uh, I, I heard that if your student interested to get A or A plus, they have to work extra. This is, sounds very strange for me, because for us, 
uh, the best student in my class, this is normal work. If you want to, uh, to get A or X, uh, A plus, this is normal activity during the seminar or workshop. Uh, if, you, if you insist the student to, uh, to work extra, this is something else, not the only the marketing. To walk extra mile and work extra uh, is a little bit different, right? You have to work differently. Uh, an excellent student and a student who pass are, have different reasons for the input in class. And um, the point, the specifics of working in uh, the environment I work in is uh, that you do have a lot of students who would not otherwise be able to cope with the class without being either stupid or uneducated or uh, without having a problem. Is that uh, some students are faster, some students are slower, the classes are huge and diversity is incredible. Therefore, if you, did you have a chance to uh, see the paper? Yes. Yeah. So That's why I'm asking. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's uh, the same grading system as you would normally have, uh, but you would have to uh, judge, ask one question, and judge by the answer uh, the level of the student. However, in the situation of such diversity as I face in my classroom, it's sometimes impossible. Therefore, that was one of the experiments, which, by the way, some student loved and some student hated. It, it, it was discussed uh, longly after that. However, it really allowed students who did their work, but are on the level of pass, pass, and the student who did more reading and extra, all the, you know, compulsory, all the extra yeah, reading, I got it. I'm going. Go there, Ace. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we had to cut off these conversations. We just I've been seeing the people from Professor Rogers' class coming in. So I'm just going to conclude very quickly. So I think the main takeaway for me is that whatever they have, the way an expert in the field would to understand what being walked through, how you interpret um, the statutes, or to understand the order in which things have to be understood, have uh, the sequences in which law happens. So um, I invite all of you later, after our closing ceremony, to stay and talk to the <laughs> All right. Uh, well, very good afternoon to all of you. As uh, we started off yesterday with this um, very, I would say, very unique uh, uh, conference uh, that we've organized really focusing on legal education and legal profession and global governance within the larger context of India-Russia. Um, I was, uh, I had the privilege to be part of yesterday's proceedings a bit. But today, of course, I wasn't there, but I know for sure that today's proceedings also went very well. I just have to make uh, three points. One is that uh, I would say that uh, uh, the potential partnership that we can build with um, the universities in Russia, the institutions which in Russia which have come together in uh, doing this conference is quite significant and we are very keen uh, in building this partnership. As I started yesterday, we have uh, India and Russia have a very long uh, relationship and friendship for many, many years and uh, it is only uh, appropriate that education institutions, uh, you know, provide leadership in building that partnership. I have elsewhere said that uh, I have very little hope on governments to do anything. So um, I strongly believe that academic institutions have a very big role to play and provide leadership in, in both our countries. Uh, and of course, uh, this has been possible because of the uh, wonderful, let's say, institutional mentorship that the Indiana University and uh, the Center for Global Legal Profession, the J heads, has been providing from the very beginning. That's the part about the partnership. The second is that uh, uh, one of the things that I believe that as an outcome of this conference is also that there is enormous scope for doing many more things between India and Russia. This particular 
conference had focused on legal education, legal profession. I suppose within the larger context of law, uh, there could be other areas, including trade and investment and IP and other areas. We have, uh, when you have a, a, a faculty like ours with over 240 uh, law professors in the law school, but also nearly 500 in the other schools, uh, there is potential for doing many more uh, interdisciplinary things, uh, which uh, is also something which we will be interested in. The third thing is that uh, we are a very student-driven institution and that also means that we try to bring the students into these conversations. And uh, as I said yesterday, although many of our students are forced to sit in these uh, you know, conferences and lectures, they, uh, they happily do so. And years later, they send thank you notes to say how useful it was. Um, but even before that type of realization, we want to be able to provide opportunities which will enable them to uh, be part of these uh, institutional experiences. And our, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done in Indiana is that we have a very close partnership where every year several of our students go to Indiana and it's been a life-changing experience for them. And I would like to see uh, young people from Jinder uh, spending uh, a semester or even several months uh, in your country and uh, in your institutions. And as academics, we have a role and responsibility to fashion opportunities for them so that they are not limited by their imagination with only a few countries which all of us have more strong partnerships, but to go beyond that. Um, we do have a partnership with the highest school of economics in Moscow, but I'm afraid we have not you know, done any substantive programs under that partnership. Um, Basin has been a very uh, strong champion for us to engage and work in these uh, countries. Russia is actually very special for all the reasons I mentioned and I do believe that there will be a lot of excitement among our student community in it. Uh, of course, a related dimension is that we also want to develop research projects, both comparative and other types of projects involving our faculty. So I think this conference has given us a lot of food for thought as to how we can do many more things together. I also want to Indiana has been always part of our journey from day one and uh, just as we celebrated our 10th anniversary a few days ago, this conference is also an example of how Indiana University and the Model School of Law and of course the Center for Global Legal Profession has been at the vanguard of building substantive and transformative partnerships which has huge impact for the life of students and faculty and also the research. So I want to take a moment to thank um, Professor Jayant Krishnan and uh, all his colleagues from India. Of course, I want to thank uh, Dr. Osipova and her colleagues from other institutions in Russia who have come to India and spent this uh, the last few days with us. So with those words, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Osipova to say a few words. Is that okay, Jay? That's, uh, sure. yeah. That's okay, and I will represent the Emerald Camp of Stanford University. Um, Seth, but experience without theory is blind. <coughs> uh, theory without experience is a mere intellectual play. I think that during these two wonderful days, we uh, managed to uh, combine both the theory and the experience very beautifully. And um, I would like to express a lot of thanks to uh, uh, a lot of thanks uh, to, for a really uh, to moderators who did their wonderful job here, to the uh, panelists for their brilliant talks, uh, for, for the outstanding organization of this wonderful event, this uh, wonderful conference, and for the warmest uh, hospitality we would have ever even dreamed, uh, to uh, the Genau uh, Global University and uh, personally to uh, the Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Raj Kumar. And um, I think that these thanks, they really um, they deserve uh, applause. So please, uh, let's uh, thank with, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very much.
also I would like to thank a lot of our uh, colleagues in France from uh, the Indiana University and Karim Lovlare and Jay, thank you very much for this idea. You know, this is the first conference, the Indian-Russia conference, and I think we successfully built the uh, platform uh, for uh, the further discussion of the educating future lawyers. Uh, and um, uh, dear colleagues, uh, our new friends uh, from India and from the Java Law School, you're very welcome um, to continue this discussion in Kaliningrad in May 2020. Um, there will be a, a conference, a big conference on uh, also the same topic. We will be talking about and sharing experience on interactive teaching on law disciplines. We will be happy to host you. Uh, and uh, also during these days of um, uh, these two days, I was writing down. Uh, phrases, words, important things uh, which were uh, um, discussed and I just wanted to uh, share what uh, what was the result uh, with you and I would kindly ask uh, the colleague, the IT uh, assistant person here. Uh, excuse me, could you? Yes, thank you. Uh, we are uh, we are in the global um, university uh, through uh, educating wonderful uh, future lawyers, and uh, what the thing we do here is very global. This is your these are your words, my dear colleagues, and the uh, very nice uh, little um, program. Well, this is about technologies, just, yes. This is a little program that helped me to build uh, exactly the idea of what we do here. It's the global thing we do here. Thank you very much. This is the world and this is how we look um, uh, as the computer things. Thanks a lot. What we've done over the last two days. Um, I think Raj said what we have and what we've seen is a really great conference that involves the themes of globalization, education, global governance, uh, professionalism, pedagogy, and international collaboration. And so in thinking about the directions that our presentations have taken, I, I actually see a few separate <clears throat> but not mutually exclusive trajectories that have occurred. Uh, yesterday and today. So one trajectory is what I would call the educational and professionalism arc trajectory. So for example, we saw some of our speakers discuss how training in our different university schools and units, law, liberal arts, business, public policy, banking and finance and so on, how, how these different schools really need to adapt to globalization in order to provide today's 21st century students with greater opportunities to maximize their career potentials. Uh, we heard about the challenges educational institutions are facing and what teachers, students, uh, and administrators have been doing to accommodate these changes. So that's, that's one trajectory. A second one, uh, particularly uh, of, of yesterday's session, might be seen, but I would add today's morning session as well, might be seen as the political uh, socioeconomic trajectory. Uh, here we heard about how state actors and civil society have been dealing with globalization and of course, uh, how some of our colleagues have been researching how globalization has uplifted large segments of our populations, but there have been those who have been left behind as well. And so questions of how we reconcile that, I think, are important. A third trajectory has been on how globalization has affected our research agendas in a variety of disciplines. We have heard, uh, I think, for example, beautiful presentations that discuss how cross-border research can have uh, potential global commonalities. Uh, but how this type of work also needs to be very sensitive, and it's really thanks to our Russian colleagues for, for highlighting this, how uh, this type of research needs to be sensitive to an array of local, cultural, historical, and anthropological factors. Similarly, we heard how globalization is affecting the research agenda of scholars studying economic competition, international relations, human rights, pedagogy, the legal labor market, the environment, and so on. And so, I think we have all found this extremely enlightening over the last two days. And I'd say the final trajectory is on how globalization is affecting uh, technology and the informational side of what's happening in a range of universities today. So to me, these four different arcs, I, I think, provide great food, great food for thought as we move forward in what I hope will be a continued collaborative uh, effort between our Russian colleagues, uh, of course, O.P. Jindal, 
Global University and our Stewart Center on the Global Legal Profession. And as I see it, um, for us to develop these ideas and issues we've discussed today, um, we really have to continue to be engaged um, with one another and with the globalized world. So as we end today on a, I think, very hopeful, inspirational uh, note, I, I really want to just say I look forward to the years ahead of our partnership together. Uh, my great thanks to all the students who came here today and yesterday, the panelists who participated, uh, OP Jindal Global University, uh, our Russian colleagues, and my colleagues from Indiana. Thanks. <laughs>